Okay. So yeah, I always have to do this disclaimer that I'm not a doctor. This is, is based on, you know, for uh, information purposes. Obviously, we talk one to one. I've got a science degree, specialist practitioner in obesity, diabetes, and a phlebotomist as well. So yeah, but not a doctor, just for information. Okay, here we go. So uh gut health and why we don't need fiber. There's a little illustration of the stomach. Obviously, when you eat food, it goes through your mouth, you chew, that's just mechanical digestion, it does help to break the food down. But the stomach, you need to have a lot of stomach acid. And uh, why do you need that stomach acid? Well, before we even talk about gut health and, and the small intestine and colon, what does the stomach do to help that situation? Well, that defense keeps pathogens out of the small intestine. So the first line is that acid. You need it a very... Um, low ph that's that's the thing it breaks the food down and you need to have an acidic acidic stomach okay so if you have a dysfunctional stomach you could have problems absorbing nutrients you could have some malnourishment and you could have intestinal troubles and that's the bit i wanted to focus on so some people it's not actually an, an issue in their small intestine or the colon it's actually the bit before where there's not enough stomach acid so that's why i wanted to just talk about this and I wanted to talk about the role of food because people might think that food is quite passive. You eat it and then uh, the body acts on it, but it's a two-way process. So uh, looking at just one amino acid in food, which is taurine, um, what happens is once that's in the system, it signals back to the body. So it's a, it's a two-way thing. Um, and what happens in studies, and this is interventional studies where they've taken taurine out, then put it back in, seeing the difference in, in secretions in the stomach. If you have more taurine, you have better secretions, basically. So the stomach acid is, 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 has more quality. And also the time when you're not eating, the stomach acidity is not as high, um, which, is, which is really good because you don't want a really acidic stomach when you're not eating um so taurine does this sort of messaging and we'll get into things like histamines in a second just to give you some practical things some food that that, that is really high in, in uh, taurine things like scallops uh tuna is really good um one thing that people might find interesting and i didn't know this until i did all my studies i always gravitated to the darker meat and darker meat tends to have more taurine so this is this is true of tuna it's also when we come to chicken exactly the same thing and like i say on playback you can do screenshots of all this sort of stuff turkey's pretty high so you know thanksgiving dinner you, you've got a lot of taurine octopus is really good you probably noticed uh, already a couple of um, seafood options and good old beef is really great so when you're eating the, the carnival way um you're you're getting a lot of the amino acid taurine and it is signaling to your stomach to regulate acidity is also working in um, conjunction with histamine which we'll come on to and it's also improving your bile which is um, a thing that you, we talk about a bit so bile is sort of like the detergent in the body um, it cleans up after digestion um, and it also obviously helps with the breakdown of fats so uh, again just talking about the light meat in chicken um, it has like 25% of the, or 20% of the taurine that the dark meat has. So um, there's so many other benefits to taurine, which I just want to quickly touch on because it does tie in with gut health. Um, it does seem when they've done studies that this reduction in stomach acidity when you're not eating has helped people to sleep. So people that um, are thinking, wow, you know, I can't sleep because I've got a little bit of indigestion, a little bit of heartburn. Um, eating earlier in the day is obviously a really good thing to do but also eating things that will regulate your stomach acid and that's mainly animal products a few fish um, seafood things there as well so that's pretty good and histamine has come up in the questions quite a bit and again i will i'm going to actually talk about this a bit more i'm going to whistle stop through the the stomach and then we'll come back to histamine but taurine degrades histamine and keeps it in check so there are a few people saying, oh, I've done carnivore, I've done it for a couple of years. This is in the questions and I'm now having histamine issues. And I will talk about why that happens. Because in the main, when you first go into carnivore, you find that histamine um, problems seem to dissipate and actually improve. And they've, they've shown that um, taurine is one particular thing. I'm not talking about taurine as a supplement. This is just from food. Um, 
it also increases the the mucus layer of the intestine which is which is really good for supporting gut health so it's working like i say in conjunction in conjunction taurine signals for the production of um, stomach acid so um don't think of histamine as a bad thing um it's only bad when it's dysregulated and we'll talk why that happens a bit later on um, if you're healing a leaky gut and things that have a lot of histamine in like um, aged meats and cured meats and cheeses and things like that um, too many um, cheeses can be a big problem because they're so tempting uh, that can actually have quite a big histamine load but we will talk about that so we'll come back to that in a minute so the gut lining is made up of epithelial cells that's just the posh way of saying cells that sort of line the inside so if you imagine the gut lining as a tube so your body is a big tube and the food that's in this tube starting from your mouth and ending at the other end of your body um, until it gets into your bloodstream it's not part of you so the gut lining is is the inside of the tube and it's made of epithelial cells so that's what it sort of looks like some foods are particularly um, deleterious to that lining of that tube hot peppers caspian spices nightshades and basically anything that's got lectins in we we'll talk about lectins at another meeting but it's this release of a thing called zonulin um, which causes the gut lining to be fenestrated and open so you get this sort of leaky gut thing and what does that what does that actually mean well that tube is is a load of junctions all together so the inner part of this tube looks like this and there are potentials for gaps here and if we just briefly touch again on histamines for instance histamine release which is a natural thing that starts the inflammatory process will widen these gaps uh, deliberately actually to allow plasma to come through and that's why you get swelling and redness and heat and uh, you know you can you can look at bits of your body that have the injuries and you can see that they're bigger and histamine is responsible for that in a good way it's um it's, a, it's the mast cells in the immune system producing histamine along with a few other things but these tight junctions they open up in endothelial cells and epithelial cells so um, we'll come back to that as well. So that's quite cool. So when you go on the internet, uh, there's often some simple tips to help you with your gut health. And these are all pretty good ones. Uh, hydrate. And the best way to hydrate, believe it or not, actually, the fat of animals produces uh, metabolic water. And that's a really good source of water. So believe it or not, in, in a ribeye, there is about 70% water. So it, it's pretty good um you can lower stress um the easiest way to increase gaba is to eat meat this is a stress relieving um substance that's released uh, moving around is really good that uh, can help with gut motility so that's basically the the gut moving food along and again late night eating we mentioned that earlier don't eat within three hours of going to bed so these are pretty straightforward things that you can get off the internet now we're going to get a little bit nuanced and people talk about the colon well that's the next bit so we had the stomach small intestine now the colon this is the bit that starts processing waste and this is also where people start talking about fiber quite a bit um the gut microbiome uh, is basically looking at in your gut the bacteria that's just a, a, a flash way of talking about it the gut microbiome and the research is still pretty much in the dark if you have your gut microbiome studied and you do like a analysis of your poop for instance uh you can get 50 to 70 percent is still unknown and they put into all databases and there's still many many things that we don't know but what they have seen is there's a correlation between many diseases and a reduction in a certain bacteria and that's the bacteria that produce butyrate which is something some of you might have heard of dehydroxybutyrate is a thing because you know when you're on a keto diet people talk about that sort of thing beta hydroxybutyrate sorry misspoke there but anyway so here we go the colon let's just check where it is the colon is uh basically the small intestine there and then then the um food will go through here or the digestive matter go through here, across and down and then out okay that's the colon and this is where we're going to quickly talk about fats and fiber and how they're all interrelated just very very brief you need to know about fats because we're going to talk about short chain fatty acids um which is 
what is allegedly the only thing you can get from fiber and has to be uh, produced in your codon, but we'll talk about that as well. So uh, a saturated fat, all that means is there's a string of um, hydro, hydrogen and carbons, hydrocarbons. So that's a uh, saturated fat there. And all that means is there's no double bonds. It's very secure. There is hydrogens and carbons matching up. And if you look at an unsaturated fat where there's a double bond, you see there's no hydrogen down here. There's no hydrogen down here. So it's unsaturated. That means there's gaps and it can bend and it, it's not as secure. OK, so they're quite long chain. And when you when you have like MCT oil and it says C16, C18, it's just how many carbons there are. And obviously a, sh a short chain fatty acid has a lot less carbons. OK, so um, we're going to talk about histamine and inflammation of different fats. And most people have heard of omega three, six and nine. A monounsaturated fat has only one of those little double bonds, and that's uh, omega-9, and it's olive oil. And then you've got omega-6, which is a polyunsaturated fat. That means it has a few more of those double bonds, a few more of those spaces, omega-6, and they tend to be inflammatory, mainly seed oils. It's all going to tie up after this, this, this slide. And polyunsaturated fat, omega-3, that has um, an anti-inflammatory effect. And these fats go into cell membranes so we're coming back to gut health now uh, just just a little plug here if you want to have a bigger look at this presentation i'll put it on youtube and for people that are watching on youtube you need to join the steak and butter girl to take part in the meetings to get all the information if you find this interesting so right so the fats that we eat um you can get 30 grams of fat from six eggs you can get 30 grams of fat from a a, a ribeye or three tablespoons of butter or 28 grams of, of, of suet. That's a fat you can get from everywhere. But butyrate, which is what your colon needs, is a short chain fatty acid. And once upon a time, and this is where people get it wrong because they still think this is true, they thought that only fiber could make this in the, in the colon. And what, that, what was postulated was you get fiber in the colon, the bacteria act on it, and it makes butyrate. And that keeps the energy of the, the colon going. Uh, that's completely not true. Um, and we need to talk about fermentation because that's what happens in the colon. You get this chemical reaction, basically. Uh, and fermentation, I think most people have heard of fermentation. Don't want to get too geeky about it. So like I say, butyrate is a short chain fatty acid, which the cells in the colon, they need it for energy. And like I say, it's once thought that only fiber could produce that. But we've now proven that you can make isobutyrate from protein. And going back to the reason I talked about the saturated fat and the animal fats like tallow and suet and, um, you know, butter, is even long chain fatty acids can be converted and used in the colon. And this has absolutely been proven. And you can even use the fats that are contained in bile. So a ketogenic diet with no fiber absolutely provides plenty of substrates around the colon and so therefore does a carnivore diet. So that's what we're saying here. Okay, butyrate can be produced from the fermentation of dietary fiber, which enters the gut epithelial cells and uh, gives it energy basically in the colon. But protein fermentation can also give you butyrate and ketones. See, even ketones from the blood can work in the um, colon. So this is the sort of thing you can send to friends who don't think you can live without fiber. Uh, and this is just a little um, illustration of basically what happens. Dietary fibers inside your gut, inside the colon, gets turned into butyrate by the bacteria and goes through this chain and produces energy. But you can also see what's really good is ketones from the liver, beta hydroxybutyrate. That can go into the cycle later on. And so can acetoacetate. That can go in. These are well-known um, products of the ketogenic diet. So that's all fine and dandy. There's lots of studies that prove that. And we now know that. So this is where I'm going to skim through because like I say, uh, you can do the longer thing on YouTube. Uh, interesting thing, I, I think for all the people that are fasting, and I, I find this particularly interesting. Um, there are even um, what's they're called acyl carnitines and they are produced and used by the epithelial cells in the colon. And they're in circulation when you fast. So even when there are no substrates, and this makes total sense and completely blows the need for fiber to make your colon work, completely blows it out of the water. Because if you're fasting, and we sort of premise this with me saying, I'm going to do a three-day fast and I've got clients doing it. If you needed fiber and you fasted, 
well, then your colon would not function. So there you go. Uh, so even when you're fasting, your body is clever enough to provide energy for the colon. Um, and it's been proven that both long and short chain fatty acids can be used by the colon to produce energy. So uh, there's references there for people that want to uh, look it up. And here's the other reason for the myth of low fiber being a problem. Every time low fiber has been identified as a problem for your gut health, it's been in combination with a really poor standard American diet, which is high in sugar. And sugar, as you know, seem to have been getting a free pass in most science um, studies or nutritional science studies. Uh, so they said, well, it can't be the sugar. It's obviously the fact it's low fiber, but now we've realized that um, high sugar, low fiber, it's probably the high sugar that's causing the problem. And certainly high seed oil consumption as well seems to be a bit of a culprit. Uh, I'm going to just plug a guy called Dr. Paul Mason. He has looked at the effects of reducing dietary fiber. It's one of the, the only studies done on human beings. And as he reduced fiber, conditions just uh, reduced and reduced and reduced. And in fact, the zero fiber had no problems. And that's just a little bit of um, a plug for, for, for Paul Mason there. So you can see that the uh, baseline diet, constipation, uh, strain opening, bloating, anal bleeding and pain was pretty bad in the um, baseline people. The high fiber diet, um, increasing fiber made these outcomes worse, reduced fiber, improved those outcomes. And he always gets a laugh when he shows this slide because the zero fiber diet, there were no symptoms. He didn't forget to put the data in. It just isn't there because everything cleared up, which is really good. Get onto the microbiome. There's a few questions about the microbiome. The posh term for the differences in bacteria is called the alpha diversity. And it was thought that um, the more diverse your gut bacteria is, the better your health is. But as they've studied this more and more, if you're healthy, and I know this is putting the cart before the horse, if you're healthy, you probably have a healthy gut microbiome or you have good alpha um, diversity. There doesn't seem to be one particular arrangement of, of gut bacteria that is, that is really um, top. Um, interesting, uh, people often talk about non-Western populations, you know, and they look at their poop and wow, their alpha diversity is really amazing. They studied some, some Italians on a pale paleolithic diet and they had gut diversity, which was really similar so the Hadza and, and the other populations, whereas Italians on the so-called healthy Mediterranean diet didn't have much diversity. So it does seem like the paleo diet is more um, um, beneficial for your gut diversity. I know we're told to keep out of the sun, um, but even exposure to sunlight has been shown to increase alpha and beta diversity. So just skin exposure to narrow band ultraviolet light that's, that's helped with your gut microbiome. So it's, it's good to have a little bit of diversity. Um, an interventional study showed that increasing fiber intake from 20% to 40% of calories meant no change in the, in the status. So all this stuff about fiber being good for your gut bacteria, helping your codon, definitely there's no science to that at all. Um, in this study, they also wanted to look at fermentable foods and they did see a slight change in the microbiome in the species. So some of those people might have actually improved from the standard uh, American diet uh, just by adding some pickle juice. I'm not recommending that, but I, you know, it's in the study if you want to look it up. I thought that was quite interesting. So uh, there's also another thing for the people who are watching got autoimmune disorders, uh, the ketogenic diet and or supplementing with ketones led to greater beta hydroxybutyrate in the gut lumen what this meant was there's more um, protection of the cells and the autoimmune um, disorders actually reduced. It also maintained the gut mucus layer uh, despite having no fermentable carbohydrates, so no fiber. And again, you can do screenshots of that. I will put links in there. Um, I don't wanna get into too much, like I say, so I'm going to just skip uh, there. I'm gonna take the screen share off and I'm gonna, um, go back to questions.